Hi everybody, good evening. It's Wednesday. Ooh, no, it's Thursday. Uh, actually, I proofread my own slides this evening, so if we see a lot of typos, you know what happens when I try to proofread my own slides. I'm not very good at that. So tonight I want to talk about moral development, and specifically in terms of adolescents and young adults as they go through this process, because I think a lot of parents would probably equate some of the, the treatment that we do, some of the treatment goals that they have for their children in the terms of moral development. So I'm going to talk about what it is tonight. I'm going to talk about what it's not. I'm going to talk about really the, the only theoretical model that, that we know that is out there, make some sense out of that, and then I'm going to go into some skills and some tools for you as parents that can be helpful. I started off with this cartoon. This cartoon is actually in my book. I, I have this on there because I think that for a lot of parents, this is the way they kind of see it. Right? This is our early conceptualizations of how to modify children's behavior. And I think it comes after some introduction to some skill set, right? That this belief that this is the enlightened parent and this is the enlightened age of parenting. And of course, I'm going to debunk this process. Don't you realize, Jason, that when you throw your furniture out the window and tie your sister to a tree, you make mommy and daddy very sad. And we're going to obviously debunk that. Let's talk first about Kohlberg stages. Like I said, in psychology, this is, there's not a lot of talk around moral development, not a lot of models, but Kohlberg is one of those models that we have, and he defines it into six stages and three general categories. And so the early stage is pre-conventional, pre obedience and punishment and or orientation. How can I avoid punishment, right? That, that's what a child looks at, is, is steering away from punishment. The second stage is self-interest orientation. What's in it for me? And the interesting thing that I have about a couple of these first two stages is I'm going to talk about later in the webinar how these are the stages that I want you to respond to your child in, right? That, 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 that a lot of them are in that pre-conventional stage, and it's okay to start there. And then secondly, that second one, I, I talk a lot about how clients will ask me, students will ask me, even parents will ask me, not as directly, what's in it for me? And I think we have a reaction to that, Right? Like, well, that's just a selfish motive. But I think there's another way of thinking about this question, like, it'll bring you greater peace and joy. Like, if a client says, what's in it for me if I stop using drugs and alcohol? What's in it for me if I go to school or I stop fighting, stop being aggressive, start being assaultive, right? I answer those questions. You know, it's a version of the reward and punishment. I want to talk about what the benefit of changing behavior is. So I'll challenge that a little bit. Level two is the conventional stage. And in this third stage, the first of level two, is interpersonal accord and conformity, social norms, the good boy or good girl. I want to be a good person, right? And a lot of our children will go into that and then come out of that later, right? They, 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 it's almost like they abandon that altogether. Authority and social order, maintaining orientation, law and order, right? It's for the greater good. It's for the community, right? We start to see in this fourth level, this fourth stage, we start to see an evolution in care and consideration for the, the greater community that we live in and the benefit for all of us. Level three, stage five, social contract orientation. And that, of course, is I'm going to make a con right? This is something that I'll do, and in return, this is what I expect back from you, right? It's, it's, a, a, it's a reciprocity. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. I will do this thing for you, and I will get this in return. And, and, and I forgot to put the number there. Level three, stage six, is universal ethical principles. And that's where we have a principled conscience, where we know at this stage what is right. We don't get told what is right by others. Right? True morality doesn't rely on experts or others. It might consider their opinions. It might consider their instruction as a springboard to thinking about it, but other people don't dictate to you what is right and wrong. You get to decide by your own sense of right and wrong. I want you to think about this question. How do you know right and wrong? If you were teaching a child at any age, or teaching an adult for that matter at any age, the question, how do you know it's right and wrong? Is it what others think and feel you should do? Is it if you hurt others? Is it if you hurt your loved ones? If you feel bad inside, you have a negative feeling inside? You know, do, do you rely or, or appeal to experts, whether that be religious experts, the Bible, the Quran, religious leaders, psychologists, professors, parents? 
I, I think if we look at each one of these bullet points, we can see the flaw in them. We can see that there are times when we're going to hurt others, but we're doing the right thing. We can even imagine circumstances where we're going to hurt our loved ones, people who care about us, want the best for us, seemingly at least, but we're willing to hurt them. Right? I can take a stand. The simplest example that I'll give to that one is in my life, my mother wants me to belong to her religious denomination, and I don't want to, and it hurts her, and she's concerned about it, and she's anxious. That doesn't mean that I need to change what I believe, that I need to join, go along with what, and it, and it hurts her. Much in the same way it would hurt her if I were doing drugs or, or having other problems. So these are not reliable reference points for morality. They all have their flaws. And if we can't trust them always, then they can't be a rule that is applied to us. We can't count on them. We can take them for consideration. We can ask ourselves difficult questions, but we can't surrender to them totally. Years ago, I was teaching a lesson about shame and guilt. I've told this story a few times. And I, I was discouraging the, the use, the, the appeal to guilt and shame. Uh, as a way of knowing right and wrong. I gave examples where many of my parents, many of my students and clients would tell me I did the, the wrong thing. And I would say, I know it was the wrong thing they would tell me. And I'd say, why did you do it? I felt guilty. I felt guilty to tell my boyfriend no. I felt guilty to tell my children no. I felt guilty because my children were hurt or upset. Or in the case of, of, of younger people, my peers were upset that I wasn't going along with them. That's why I sacrifice part of myself. And so I was trying to discourage this, this idea that we could rely on guilt and shame, teaching that sometimes we have to learn to feel guilt, tolerate it, to be able to do the right thing. And a, a lawyer in the class that I was teaching raised his hand. He said, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I'm confused. And he gave the example that when he was in law school, he visited a prison and he interviewed an inmate. This was part of a, a class that he took. And he said, this individual had robbed a convenience store and stole a couple hundred bucks and and killed the the, the teller or the, you know the the cashier and my lawyer friend asked this convict he said what did you do with you when you were done because he was trying to kind of grapple with how that would feel wondering what kind of conscience this conscience this man had and the man said I just went home and went to bed went to sleep so he's saying but if not for guilt why would we do the right thing why would we do right at all? If guilt and shame are not reliable sources of right and wrong, then where do we find our morality? I propose that it comes from love. A healthy love for ourselves and an empathic connection to others are both powerful sources of morality. Empathy is developed as we become more aware of our whole selves, our thoughts, feelings, and hidden parts that we left behind long ago. Discovering who we truly are must involve an exploration of our childhood. It is part of the hero's journey. And when we become more clear about who we are and why we are this way, we will develop a clearer idea of others. So from a sense of wholeness, right? When we learn to feel, we recognize feelings in others. When we learn not to feel, when we numb ourselves, when we dissociate, we don't see others as feeling. And, and so there's this, this connection between love of self, awareness of self, feeling, wholeness, and empathy, and morality, and kindness. And it has to come from an awareness. Because I can think, I just talked to a parent today where we were discussing two potential options, responses to her child in a letter. Two opposite, seemingly opposite responses. And what I said to her was, again, it's not about what you do. I don't I'm not going to tell you what to do. But let's talk about the thinking. Why would you do one and why would you do the other? Because that's going to define whether or not it's the right thing, quote unquote. If you do it to try to reduce her anxiety or reduce your anxiety, right? Try to enable, re rescue her then it doesn't matter what you do. It's not going to be okay. It's not going to be the right thing. If you do it because it, it stems from your truth, from your intention, from an honest intention, from a loving intention, from a kind intention, with consideration about how I can be helpful, it doesn't sacrifice core elements of who you are, you can't do it wrong. And I gave examples where both choices could have motives, intentions, that were unhealthy or, or less than ideal or, or immoral, if you will. And both choices could also have the exact opposite. They could have a, a moral foundation. So we developed something much larger, much more complex than guilt and shame. Something reliable. Something away from something that can be influenced by those around us. 
um, I talk about this wiring, right? When, when we tell our children that, that we are responsible for their feelings, we wire them to be vulnerable to peer pressure, to, to not developing a full sense of self. And, and what, where this comes from is when they surpass our limits, when they upset us, when we can't respond to them with all that they need, we send that badness back on them. I feel bad that I can't give you what you need. And so what do I say? Instead of owning my lack of capacity, and I don't have in, infinite capacity, I say you're selfish, you're, you're not winning, whining, wallowing, you're being a victim, right? I, I, I have to get that badness, that bad feeling out of me and put it on. You're the bad one. I, I can't tell you how many times I'll hear somebody in therapy start to express a pain or a hurt a grievance about somebody and they will qualify it happened to me yesterday it'll happen to me tomorrow they'll qualify and say but but I'm grateful I'm grateful that he's my father that he's my brother that he's my my sister that he's my child whatever it is and I, I, I interrupt and I say that's not your voice you don't have to do that for me somebody told you somewhere that when you were upset with them that you were whining that you were wallowing that you were being selfish they did that because they could not contain you. They could not be there for you. You, you surpass their limitations, their capacities. And then they had to make you feel bad because they didn't want to feel it. So that's what that is. We make others feel bad so that we don't have to feel in inadequate and bad ourselves. Now, we all have limits. We, we all don't have infinite capabilities and patience, right? That's okay. It, what that does for children is that they have to develop frustration tolerance. They have to see others, right? They have to develop delay of gratification. They have to learn to adapt to the world. If we were infinitely compassionate and patient, they wouldn't have to do all of that. But what's important about this is that I own it as mine. It's my limitation. That's why I said last night, that's why I've, I've, I've talked about this late, lately. My wife has, has done this beautifully by taking timeouts with my eight-year-old, with our eight-year-old. She doesn't give her timeouts. Rarely does she. She says, I need a timeout. And it has the exact same effect. And what she's communicating to the child is, you're just a child. You're just doing what you're doing. I can't be patient right now. I'm about to blow up. I'm about to get sarcastic, rude, mean, whatever. I'm about to use fear, whatever it is. So I need some space so I can take care of myself. I want to read this quote. It's a long quote, but this is essentially what I'm, what I'm teaching tonight. It's from a book called The Misery of the Good Child by J.D. Gill. You can get it on Amazon. This is the opening page. All persons have limits. Consequently, all parents have limits. It is routine for us to discipline or punish our children when they exceed our limits. Unconsciously, our goal in doing this is to get them to behave in ways that we can more easily tolerate and manage. Besides, it makes our load lighter. It is routine in these interactions for us to feel that we are helping the child by our actions. They can't just go around upsetting people. The world, after all, has limits, and the child needs to learn about these. This is a way of saying parents have different bandwidths, I love that, of what they can and cannot handle. Some parents are extremely rigid and can only manage little breath. Some, on the other hand, can manage a wide range with seeming ease. From the child's perspective, however, the picture is not so clear. First of all, the child picks up a mixed message. The over-the-table message is, this is for your own good. The under-the-table message is, this is my limit. I can't go any farther. That is, the parent is being, that is, the parent is being incapable. What now? The child is likely to be puzzled, if not frightened. I will tell you that when parents can start talking about their limitations, this is what I need. When they can start developing boundaries that stem from, that, that arise from their own truth, that arise from their own necessity to feel okay in the world. When they can do that, the child is liberated. He or she can tolerate and, and then the question of what's the limit becomes clear. And then the child doesn't get confused. And the child doesn't think it's about him or her all the time. And they learn to develop a sense of self that's separate. So how do you know right and wrong? We, we, we begin to ask the question and consider it more in, in a deeper way. One piece that we have to consider in parenting children is that the, the development of self is more important than getting it right. right? That, that includes that our children are going to make lots of mistakes, repeated mistakes. And that if we can 
we can still have boundaries, right? We can have limits, and I won't challenge where those limits are for you. You get to have them. You get to decide what you feel comfortable with. That is your prerogative. And if a therapist or professional comes along and suggests to you that if you do it wrong, if your limit is at the wrong place, you're causing addiction, you're causing the problem, I'm giving my cell phone and my, my, um, my email address. The, the, the piece of it is, is can we send a clear message and can we provide a place for our child where they can figure it out? Can we provide that safety, that containment, that differentiation and, and honor? And I talk about it in terms of valuing mistakes, valuing the struggle. Not, learning to respond to our own feelings of anxiety and, and terror and dread and doom. For a lot of our clients, our students, your, your children, a lot of what this struggle becomes about is this what we call an inclusion fear, right? This fear of being swallowed up. I'm going to decide something outside of my parents' value and paradigm so I can maintain a sense of self, right? That's why they will cut off their nose to spite their face. That's why they will throw the ba baby out with the bathwater, excuse me, because they don't want to be swallowed up or they don't want to disappear. And if I do what you say, if I'm just an extension of you, if that's all that I am, I don't exist. And so that's why the, 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 the royal road, if you will, to morality isn't straight through just teaching them and telling them what to do and getting it right all the time. Moralizing with children invites a power of struggle because the essence of identity is finding and defining one's own way and value. So. We, we become pragmatic instead of moralists with our children. We talk about what works and what doesn't work. We talk about what we need and what we don't need, excuse me. What we feel comfortable with supporting or not. What I feel comfortable with in my house. What I feel comfortable supporting, encouraging, reinforcing, rewarding. This is what I feel comfortable with. Well, dad, you're an idiot. Okay. The opposite, of course, is I make you wrong. Right? If you don't get it, if you're not responding, you're wrong. When you're mad at me, you're wrong. You don't get it. Right? That's what we do, again, to, to, to manage our own anxiety and those interactions. In terms of teaching empathy, when someone learns to feel their feelings, they can recognize in others. That is how we develop empathy. I can't say it any more simply than that. I worked with violent offenders and sex offenders. And the, the curriculum was not, look what you did to people. It was not that. That's not the way to do it. Look at the effect you have on grandma and grandpa. Look at the effect that you have on the children that you hurt. Look at the effect you're having on mom and dad. That's not the thing. And we think it is because that's the way we were taught. That's the way morality was encouraged in us. But what we are encouraged to do with these near sociopathic individuals is teach them to feel. How did you feel today when you got cut off in, in, the, in the street? How did you feel when somebody cut in front of you in the, in the grocery store line? How did you feel when your wife yelled at you? We, we, and they learn to feel. And then you could see this connection. The more sensitive, the more open, and it took, it took, in most cases, many years. In fact, during my, the time I was with them, I never finished a, a, a client's treatment because they were, were, they were there for so long. But what you could start to see is you could start to see them say, oh, I realized how I hurt people. I realized what I did. I can see that now because they feel it. They're opening up. And, and, and most of these people had learned not to feel. So they had no capacity for empathy. They had themselves been turned into an object, turned themselves into an object to survive. So everybody else was just an object, not a person, not a human being. Some skills. Actually, this first slide is about some, some principles, do's and don'ts, don'ts and do's. And then I'll talk about some very simple skills. Don't lecture or debate. That, that's an effort for you to try to convince them. You don't need to convince them. Let them disagree, be upset, not like it. That's a great gift to give to your children. Give them that liberty. Moralize and, and preaching, right? We want to talk them into it through, through some kind of moral speech. You need to understand this is right and wrong. You need to know what's appropriate and inappropriate. You need to. Um, don't make it about right and wrong. And I'll talk about what to do. Require, don't require consensus, right? We need to agree on this. You need to like it. You need to sign off on this. Most parents, because they're afraid to set boundaries and, and live with the consequences and be human about it, be empathic about it because they weren't allowed to, as children, just feel the way that they feel, right? 
they have a hard time then in return giving that to the children. You, you don't have to, and when your child tells you, when, you, when you're in the place where you're not requiring consensus and your child says, you're wrong, you're an idiot, this is a stupid idea, your response is, maybe, I, I don't know, might be. I'm doing the best that I can and I could be wrong. And then there's no debate, no argument. Don't use guilt and shame to try to create empathy, like I was saying. It's not about, I, I've told the story, but I'll retell it because it's for this webinar, about a young woman who had a, a, a couple of impact letters. I was sitting in her group, and she read these horrendous impact letters of significant substance abuse and stealing, uh, sexual promiscuity to the point I think it was prostitution was involved. And it was from mother and father and grandmother. And at the end of it, she was sobbing, and the girls in her group were waiting patiently. And after some, some moments of sobbing, one of the girls asked her, How are you feel what are you feeling right now? And she said, I, I feel so bad how I let my parents down. And my thought was, that's the least important thing in this. You let yourself down, right? You're stealing from your grandparents for, for a substance abuse issue, an addiction issue. You're prostituting yourself. Yes, you, you let your parents down, but that can't be the measure. Otherwise, you have no reference point for morality. You are not developing that kind of morality that, that Kohlberg talks about at the higher level. Teach them how to feel. And the way that you teach them how to feel is you let them feel. Anything about you, as long as it's said relatively respectfully and that takes time, and that's what we're doing, then you say, thank you for telling me. Don't tell them the truth. Don't correct them. Don't talk them out of it. Don't explain your intentions. Don't try to teach them what you were doing. All of, don't try to justify your actions. Your response is, thank you for telling me. I'm glad you're talking about it. I'm sorry that I hurt you. All right? That's what it looks like when you're teaching somebody how to feel. When you have the capacity, when you develop the capacity to see others, to see your child. And don't project your badness when you reach your limits, right? That, that's, that's a complex, high-level principle that we're talking about tonight, but I threw it in here because it's been so at, at the forefront of, of a lot of the work that I've been doing lately with some of our parents, right? Making the children bad, themselves feeling bad, if they themselves were hurt or angry at their own parents. They, they, they feel it was a sense of betrayal because that's what they were told that it was. Set boundaries. Right? It's okay. It's okay for them to learn from the outside in. I, I think we want to talk them into it or convince them or get consensus because we want them to have an aha moment and then just start to live by the principle. Because we don't want to have to be required to set a boundary and be the, unpop be the bad one. Deal with our guilt. So it's, we practice setting boundaries. We practice saying, here's the limit. Here's the boundary. This is what I'm comfortable with. This is how much sugar you can have tonight. This is when you can come home tonight. That's what I feel comfortable with. And then you're doing your work on the side to, to be more aware of yourself, of course. You're developing that. It's okay to teach from the inside, excuse me, from the outside in instead of from the inside out. I've had parents tell me that some of the most important principles that they've learned through this process is that they've been trying to get the child inspired. Right, trying to get the child to a point of insight or, or rational thinking. Think about your children as, not even if they don't use any drugs or alcohol, think about them as a drunk person. You can't reason with a drunk person. So stop trying. Be courageous enough to set boundaries on what you feel comfortable with or what you need rather than having to be right. That's what I've been saying all along time. Meet them where they are at on the scale. Right? So we want them to be more mature. We want their moral development to be higher. First of all, I would be surprised if anybody watching this webinar both live tonight or someday at a, some, at a later point sometime, are aware of this some of the dynamics we're talking about. So you're evolving. I did this webinar in 2009. I'm redoing it tonight. It was the webinar, one of the webinars that I've redone where I had to rewrite almost all of it. Okay? Because where I was in 2009 is not where I am in 2016. So I'm evolving too. So we're all evolving. Meet them where they're at. Start to respond to them where they're at on the scale. It's okay. It's okay for them to be in stage one and two, level one. See them and understand all that symptoms are expressions of wounds, right? If we can start to get out of the paradigm of right and wrong and into understanding wounds and symptoms and mental health issues and brain development, we're, we're learning that. We're learning about wiring. We're learning about where impulsivity comes from how people process fear, how people lose access to the 
to the top part of the brain. How the brain, the part of our brain that thinks about the future, that understands some of the complexities that are involved in moral thinking, aren't present. We understand now about addiction that it's not a moral failing, but it, that it's a disease. We know that about bipolar, right? ADHD, on and on and on. We're, we're, our science is starting to catch up with, with our intuition, which is symptoms are wounds. If, if, if someone's being mean, if somebody's stealing, somebody's lying, all, you know, just go through, there's a wound beneath that. The symptom is the expression of that. And if we can develop the capacity to see that, then just like the, the, the way that the war on drugs is, is changing from a war on drugs to treating drug addicts as patients with a disease, it's going to happen everywhere. But it will require us to confront our own darkness. I was talking to my daughter about some of these ideas and about how it really does relate to this idea in therapy of counter-transference and transference and how we can be there and meet, meet our clients where we're at. She said, and I said, you know, they don't teach us in school, sometimes ever. And my daughter said, this should be the first thing that they teach in school. And, and she said, why don't they? And I said, because professors have a hard time looking at their stuff. This doesn't feel comfortable. This doesn't feel right, even. This feels amoral to people. It's confusing. And then I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to own some of my stuff. Some of this then is going to have to be about me. I don't want this to be about me. I don't want any of me to be in this equation. The simplest way that I can put it out there is to use these simple tools. And we talk about this in the impact letter. And this is something we try to do in our entire program. Don't use the words should, have to, must, need to, good, bad, right, and wrong. Right? Try to keep away from those. And do use I feel, I think, I believe. In my experience, this is how it's worked. What I want, what I, what I hope for, my experience and what I found to work, this is what I need to do, this is what I need to feel comfortable. There's a few typos here, like I said, I proofed my own slides. So, so we begin to talk about it in those ways. It's the same principles in the, in the landmark book, Nonviolent Communication. It's the same thing in communication skills training with the I feel statement, right? This, I'm, I'm not inventing any of this. I'm tying it to theory and psychology, but I'm not inventing it. This is the way that we evolve. This is the higher level of thinking. This take-home slide is a little bit more dense than most. So require the behavior, not the belief or agreement. We talked about that. It's okay to have consequences. That's how children learn. I've told the story when a mother of an eight-year-old said, my son is doing his choice, but he doesn't see the big picture. That he's part of a family and how important it is. What do I do? And I say, you don't do anything. That's what eight-year-olds, that's the way they are. You require it. You have empathy when he complains. You don't let him abuse you or be disrespectful of him, whatever your limit is. But you don't require your eight-year-old to get the big picture. Um, being, uh, I don't know what that one means, so I'm going to skip that one. Stop expecting them to grow up. What I relate to is this idea that I end up being resentful. I want my children to get it, and I keep expecting them. You know, as they grow up, I have children from today, from eight years old to, to 22. And I keep expecting, I kept expecting the 22 and the 21-year-old to get it, right? And they don't, yeah. And they get a lot of it. And the 13-year-old, she doesn't get a lot of it. And I ended up resentful. I didn't want to set a boundary. I didn't think it was my job. If children did what we wanted, remember how I said earlier, if, if parents were infinitely capable, children wouldn't have to learn some important lessons. If children were infinitely cooperative, then we wouldn't have to learn how to set boundaries and confront some of our own, our own dragons, our own fears. So expecting them to grow up is uh, it's a you problem. You just set boundaries and meet them where they're at. And some of them are farther along than others. Many of your children aren't developed as the children that are in our program. It's not all true, but many of them are, and that's why they're here. And that's where you're meeting them at. My, my therapist, when I was a teenager, said, you know, in some ways, your mother expanded the circle too early. And now, when I got sent to treatment, she's closing it down. And that's going to be miserable to you. That's going to feel horrible to you. And that's, that's in a lot of ways what you've done. It was like this when they were at home. And you played around with it, experimented, guessed at it. And now they're at Evoke or a therapeutic school afterwards. And it got this small. And it's going to be, there's going to be some resistance. It's okay to reward honesty as part of the process, but by definition, children, there's typically 
they struggle with that. They, they, they see honesty, total vulnerability and transparency, again, as a, a threat to their being smothered and swallowed part of their privacy. So we don't have to judge it. We just reward it, acknowledge it. In the book Nurture Shock, when they talk about honesty, the two groups of people that were, I, I believe, the least able to recognize if a child was telling the truth were parents and police officers, which I found, found fascinating. Children would say to me in my group for years, you know, Brad's a genius. He can read your mind. And all I was doing is I just was being skeptical. I just knew when they were selling me something that it wasn't true. When I was trying to be convinced, when they were playing, I just knew it wasn't true. And so I waited and I was skeptical and I didn't take anything at face value. And then I was a genius and then I could mind read. Change your emphasis from trying to control the outcome to listening. Spend some time listening. That's why I say in the behavioral chapter of the book, the very first opening paragraph is we would be wise to spend some time understanding what the behavior might be teaching us about the child before we try to change it. Share your dilemmas. Share your struggles. Share your examples of peer pressure, of worrying about what the Jones think or worrying about the community think. All of you have some unsolved issues. Instead of lecturing to them about how to get it right, talk about how you're struggling to get it wrong. Talk about how you're struggling to get some of this stuff. Talk about your resistance to go to Al-Anon or go to meetings or go to therapy and see what they write back. In terms of developing empathy, attend to their needs, respond to their needs, and it's okay to be present with your needs. The idea of the selfless parent, I would do anything for my child, everything I've ever done for my child, they know that's not true. And, and it's crazy making. They know at some level that you have a limitation and that some things are for you and so that gets confusing to them. But because again, we, we have this crazy need to be the good one and teach them how to feel. And you teach them how to feel by developing your containment capacity. There's a webinar on containment. And that's a complex word for listening. When we have a webinar on healthy communication where we talk about listening. I like wellness therapy because it's an alternative culture. right? Our staff don't look like you, don't sound like you, don't dress like you, don't smell like you for sure. They have different perspectives, but they teach the same core values that you want your children to learn. And so your children begin to learn it's not from... It's not about my parents. That's why this works. That's why touring, you know, going around and traveling around the country works. Because we begin to see the common threads of morality, of what it means to be human. And don't try to be right. Because if you're right, they're wrong. And that's too difficult. You can just be you. I don't have to be right about the fact that I don't want marijuana in my house. I just get to decide it because it's my house. And I'm, my, my position is I'm, I'm the dad. It's just my house. Just... I'm not comfortable with it. I'm not comfortable with you not going to school. I'm not comfortable with the eating behavior or whatever it is. Um, and remember the guilt and shame are not reliable sources. They will sometimes go against morality. They will sometimes encourage people to do the immoral thing. The easiest example is a young woman, a young girl, raised to believe that when her parents are upset, it's her responsibility has no way to understand when her boyfriend tells her that he loves her that she should do certain things. She has no way to resist that because she's been told that when people who care about her tell her that, that they're hurting her, then she has to respond. And, and that's why I talk about peer pressure and, and, and emotions, right? And parenting. Be careful because we do really do replicate and wire our children that way. All right, I'm happy to take any live questions, Michael, on topic, and then we have time for any off-topic questions. I will go to some of our announcements, and then we can go when there's the next slide on question. I have a couple of new, if you watched it last night, this is a repeat, but if you haven't watched it in a few days, the Parent Workshop, January 23rd, 24th, is coming up. Talk to Gail. Uh, I'm doing a heroic parenting workshop. Uh, it's filling up. I think it's a $15 fill fee. I'm not sure. Carol at FamilyEnvolvementCenter.org is the person to contact. You can register with her. We'll do a workshop. I'll do some lecturing, do some um, practice scenarios, role playing. Finding You is filling up. So eight, February 18th to 21th, contact intensives at evoketherapy.com. There are some others there coming up in the future. Finding You in heroic parenting is the same curriculum. It's just one 
allows for young adults, one doesn't, one you have to be a parent. But if you're a parent, finding you as the same exact program as if you were to go to hero heroic parenting. Upcoming parent support groups, Los Angeles, Bay Area, New York City, Houston, Chicago. Any questions to RSVP, contact Stephanie at evoketherapy.com. Please do RSVP if you're coming. If you RSVP, please do come or tell us that you're not coming if you need to change your mind. Pursuits is our high adventure course for families and young adults. You can go to our website to find out about that. We want all family members to go to these 12-step meetings for the family members and loved ones of people who are practicing an addiction or other self-destructive, self-defeating behaviors. So it's not just for wives of alcoholics. Follow us on social media for announcements. We've been having some great content lately, some great blogs. The book is now available on paperback on Amazon. came out on Tuesday, so you can find a copy there. All right, any other live questions? Happy to take them. Where do we start when we want a more authentic relationship with our son? But we know that he is dishonest with us. That's a great question. You wait. I mean, you're authentic. That's what you do. You show up authentically. Learn to know yourself better. And then you respond to him. See, I was talking with my staff today. I do staff supervision once a week and therapist supervision once a week. And I was talking with our staff today. And part of what I was teaching was in the early stages of the program, kind of like I said earlier, students would accuse me of not caring, of being distant, of being cold. Because I, I had a flat affect because I wasn't buying anything. I was just waiting. I was just skeptical. And I, I, it wasn't like I wanted to lecture. They weren't in a place where they, I could have lectured them or taught them about dishonesty or distrust or manipulation. Not early on. I just didn't respond. I just said, okay. But, but I held my boundaries. I didn't make any different decisions with their privileges, right? They didn't get to go home. They didn't get to call mom and dad. They didn't move through the program in terms of levels of opportunity and privilege. So I just held boundaries. So I, I think... You hold boundaries. I, I think ideally you don't judge this. You just see that it's, and you learn and you listen, what's he afraid of? Even ask yourself, am I doing something that's contributing to him not feeling safe? Is there, is there work there? And there may not be. But that's a, a good question to ask. Understand, look at the symptom. Understand the fear, the anxiety, the wound. Know that he's just trying to control you. That's what people do. Know that probably there's a history where he's been successful with you or others at controlling people because people are... are, are you make, I always tell parents, you don't have to make a decision. You don't have to change your mind or, or your boundaries. Just say, I'm not ready. And I don't have to be right. And I don't have to know every time. And I'm going to get it wrong sometimes. But here's my boundary. Here's my limit. And you know this is what it's going to be. Well, you don't trust me. I'm, yeah, I don't. How does that feel? It feels horrible. I'm sorry. I'm sorry it hurts. I just, I just can't. And, and a lot of parents feel that they have to trust their children or they're destroying their self-esteem. That's not true. If you're authentic and you see your child, you know that children don't tell the truth. It's okay. It's okay in the sense it's okay not to trust them. So that's what authentic, authenticity is. Knowing yourself, doing your work, being clear, and seeing your child. Even when their words Try to hide who they are through deceptions, denial, ignorance, lying, whatever it is. You see them clearly. And then seeing, learning to see, developing a capacity to see their, their, their wounds beneath their symptoms. All right, folks, I hope this was helpful. Hope this brought up some new type of thinking. A lot of this was you could read about in the book Journey of the Hope Parent if you haven't read it already. Um, the role of the fear instructor is my next webinar. That will be on Thursday. January 28th, a week from tonight, 2016, 7 p.m. Mountain Time. So I look forward to that. I'm going to be in California. We have a parent meeting in California next week. We have in Southern California, I'll be running. Some of our therapists are going to be running up into Northern California, so we know you'll enjoy that. Have a great week, and I'll talk to you next Thursday. Take care. Bye-bye.